if we're really going to integrate newcomers in our sector, we have to do more than just talk the talk. You're listening to Let's Imagine, an Imagine Canada podcast for everyone interested in social issues and the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Bruce McDonald. At Imagine Canada, we believe that by leveraging our national vantage point, building cross-sector relationships, and sharing and developing our knowledge base, we can advance social, economic, and environmental justice through our collective action. Join us as we dive deep into conversations that have big implications for the nonprofit and charitable sector here in Canada. A special thank you to our knowledge partner, Carter's Professional Corporation. Together, let's imagine a stronger future. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our two guests today. We have Senator Ratna Ahmadvar, member of the Independent Senators Group and a longtime champion of our sector, and Dr. Kamali Powell, the CEO of Rainbow Railroad. In terms of setting the context for the conversation today, as we know going forward, this country is welcoming 1.5 million newcomers to our shores in the coming three years. In addition, the data about our sector talks about and demonstrate, it demonstrates our ability as a sector to be a major contributor to the newcomer experience. From a service delivery perspective, newcomers to this country often have two points of contact, government and charities and nonprofits, as they seek to establish their lives here in Canada. And as we've learned from employment data, the pathway to employment for many immigrants, particularly immigrant women, is through charities and nonprofits. And so today we want to explore a little bit about the future of Canada and how it will be shaped by immigration. And so with that, I'm going to turn first to Senator Amadvar, who identifies as a newcomer, identifies as an immigrant, just for some opening comments on this important topic. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you so much for having me here. You talked about a home in government. I completely ascribe to that and and will work on making that aspiration a reality. But my real home is the charitable and not-for-profit sector, and for many, many reasons. But on the bigger question of immigration and numbers and readiness, I will only look into the future and share with you what you already likely know. Population growth is an underlying concern in Canada. And growth in immigration is necessary for a bigger, bolder, more prosperous Canada. So regardless of which political stripe, and I deal with politicians of all stripes, they might want to calibrate the numbers here and there a little, But by and large, I think I can safely predict that the growth in immigration numbers will continue. And as you talked about 1.5 million over the next three years, let's not forget almost double that number of temporary residents who also need help and services. So getting back to home, I am a senator today because my first real job was in a settlement service organization. I started as a volunteer. I got hired by them. They saw something in me. And that was the beginning of my career in the not-for-profit sector. And that wonderful jewel of an organization is a settlement neighborhood house in Kensington Market, St. Stephen's Community House. I believe their CEO is here. It is my favorite spot in the city. And as I see Waves of newcomers visiting that place for childcare, for services, for housing support, for senior support. It makes me understand better every time that whilst immigrants may rely on their own family networks, and and Bruce, I will say there are three points of contact, the government, the not-for-profit sector, and before the not-for-profit sector comes family and friends. And here's the nub of the problem. Family and friends often give you misleading information, not because they want to set you on the right path, but because they came 20 years ago and they don't realize how things have moved. So I believe it is an essential part 
of our growth and prosperity, that charities and not-for-profits continue to serve immigrants, but connect with families in a more vibrant way to bring families and friends into the settlement cote. Amazing. And if we, if we ever wondered about the role and the, and the influence of the Canadian Senate, our guest today is a living example of the power of persistence, determination, and a willingness to champion the cause of nonprofits and charities. And Senator, for all the work that you've done, thank you on behalf of our sector. I bear the scars. I bear the scars. <laughs> We're going to invite our other guests into the conversation now. And, and to start off with, first of all, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Rainbow Railroad, because I'm not sure that every organization that will be listening will be familiar with it. And then I'll invite you to just talk about your opening comments around the importance of immigration, both to Canada and to our sector. Sure. Good morning, everybody. So Rainbow Railroad is an international organization based in Canada and the United States. And our mission is pretty straightforward. We help persecuted LGBTQI plus people around the world find pathways to safety. Uh, and our work intersects two phenomenon that affects our communities. One, there are 110 million people who are now forcibly displaced. That's the number that the United Nations Refugee Agency has predicts where we'll be at by the end of this year. That will be the highest number on record. And just to really understand how rapid this number is increasing. I think maybe 18 months ago, we were reporting that number being 80 million and that being the highest number since the Second World War. And so this is the rapid rate of which people are forcibly displaced around the world. And so when we talk about the backdrop of immigration and, you know, quote unquote, proper or regular immigration. We just know that the, the, the sheer number of people on the move and displaced by the intersection of climate, war, famine, Etc. means that there are just more people going to be looking for safe haven. So some of you probably knew that. The other touch point that you probably have not heard of or are not familiar with is that there are 67 countries that criminalize same-sex intimacy. And for context on that touch point, you know, there are 195 UN member states around the world. And up until India decriminalized same-sex intimacy in 2018, you can imagine the size of India, uh, two-thirds of the population were in countries that criminalized same-sex intimacy. And that situation affecting the LGBTQI plus community coupled with forced displacement means that individuals who are members of the community, are usually at risk. And the fact of the matter is traditional modes of immigration don't necessarily apply for this community, which is why Rainbow Railroad really was formed. If you think about how migration works, how communities arrive in Canada, you know, our, I started Rainbow Railroad, was actually the one staff person with a contract part-time staff. We were in a work share at CSI. My colleague Colin was a work buddy in our building. Uh, and I, I have had the real tremendous privilege to grow the organization from, from that seven years ago to now a team of 50 who in two countries who relocated over 2,000 people in the seven years I've been here. Thanks. Uh, uh, and although I'm, I appreciate the applause, we f spend most of our time thinking about who we have not yet helped. We receive about 10,000 requests of assistance every year. And the phenomenon that we deal with, uh, especially as it relates to forced migration for this particular vulnerable community, is that many of the countries that affect migration are in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Asia, or the Caribbean. I mentioned Sub-Saharan Africa, and I, I, I re this is where I have to put an asterisk that these laws are relics of colonial laws from the British. And it's really easy for people to target the countries. But if you want to target the countries, listen to Theresa May, who I think... I don't know, was she like six prime ministers ago? I didn't, and they go at a rapid clip uh, in the UK, but she issued an apology, a formal apology, uh, because of the impact of those laws in those communities. But the relevance for you all from this phenomenon is that most of the countries that criminalize same-sex intimacy border each other. And in order to gain refugee protection here in Canada, you have to register to the UN agency and wait 
for a long time, usually years. If you're LGBTQI+, you're leaving from one country that criminalizes same-sex intimacy to another. I just came from Uganda. I was there in July. Uh, Uganda passed in May the most egregious LGBTQI plus law on, on record that, among many things, puts imposes a death penalty for serial offenders of homosexuality, which would include me. And the same law is being introduced uh, potentially in Kenya, which is where most refugees flood. So that's why Rainbow Railroad exists, to deal with the fact that we've seen with the Syrian crisis that although that war, then that conflict that ensues, of course, is devastating to its people, people were able to migrate in community uh, and Canadians receive them in community. Being an LGBTQI plus refugee or someone who's forced to displace is a very isolating and lonely thing. And sometimes you are being, you're fleeing from your own families. And so relevant to this conversation is the need for communities of care when they arrive in places like Canada. And that's why Rainbow Railroad exists. Amazing work. It's also interesting as I think about a future podcast on scaling an organization. We may have to have you back because that's an incredible story, both on the ability of the organization to grow and thrive, but also it it speaks to this need that's there. Just, I got to do a little flex on this. Rainbow Railroad, actually up until this day. So our budget, when I think I, when I started, we had just gotten a grant. Uh, so TD came on as our first sponsor. We got a grant from a foundation in Winnipeg, the Upside Down Tree Foundation, for $400,000. And I think our operating budget was went from 70000 to 300000 And when I took the job, I knew that grant came in. I was like, okay, maybe I'll get paid. I mean, you know, and to date, we are consolidated $15 million operating budget. And I say that flex, not because of the money, but actually the point I want to make is that up outwards of one grant, we've received one grant from the government of Canada, 99% of our operating budget is private and unrestricted. I make that point is because it we are an organization from our community who's solving a problem for our community and resourcing for our community. So it's just an example of the fact that we can collaboratively solve problems. Amazing work. So I'm going to come to a question to both of you, and I'll, I'll start with you, Senator Amadvar. The unique strengths and contributions of newcomers to our sector are, are undeniable. In some research that was released in the fall of 2022, statistics showed that our sector over-indexes when it comes to the employment of newcomers. While about a quarter of employees in the rest of the economy immigrated to Canada at some point in their lives, nearly half of nonprofit workers did so. What do you think meaningfully contributes to this? And also, what do you think it says about our nation when folks are coming to our country and half of them are coming to a sector that is, in fact, the poorest paying of the three sectors? It's often viewed as this there's a, both a positive and a negative side to this data point. Offer you an opportunity to, to sort of reflect on the employment construct of our sector. So let me first start by congratulating Kamali. I have worked very closely with him on the Afghan refugee crisis and the resettlement of Afghan refugees. Absolutely amazing work. To your question, I am both heartened. I am an optimist. My name, Omi Far, is Persian, which means hope. But I'm also disheartened by your report. I'm heartened by it because uh, this is the sector that does not necessarily always ask for Canadian credentials. That is a plus. Nobody asked me when I joined St. Stephen's, where had you gone to university or is there an equivalency? Now, if I had pursued my occupation from university, I don't know if I would have been sitting here today. So I I kind of, you know, every immigrant's path is a series of accidents that happen. So I give huge credit to the sector for looking at potential as opposed to credentials. Employment in a not-for-profit or a charity is often the first stop in the integration process of many immigrants. You know, you can do another research project. You started at the not-for-profit, but where are you today? You would be very heartened by that result, I believe, if I'm a case story. But I am disheartened when I read your report about the poor pay and working conditions, the lack of security, stability, 
And I believe, I understand that funding is an issue, that funding defines how you treat your workers. But I've had a different experience in the sector because my first job at St. Stephen's was in a unionized environment. So the presence of a union in the workforce makes a difference regardless of funding. Now, I know the word union may may scare many of the executive directors. And later on in my career, I was the executive director of, uh, of an organization and the unions came nipping. And you do worry as a team member of the management, but it forced me to look at the working conditions and include things like security, include options in our personnel policy that you couldn't simply offer an employee one contract after another contract after another contract. We instituted pension plans because if we hadn't done so, if we hadn't done so, we would have been forced to do so outside of our own will. And I do believe that the will of the grassroots, the will of an organization should be expressed in a fulsome way. So I will say this to you. If you want better working conditions, if you want pension plans for your people, look at what the unions have done. Same topic in terms of the composition of the workforce and just your thoughts around what that sort of means, both for the not-for-profit sector and for Canada. Thanks. I have such deep respect for the senator, but I don't want any of my staff listening to the word union um, and our work. Um, uh, so... One of the freedom of having made the conscious decision, by the way, not to rely on government funding is that it's set, you know, we are, I operate a charity in two countries and two jurisdictions and, and it gave a lot of flexibility to imagine what a LGBTQI plus, and I'm going to use the word queer organization can do or imagine, which was really powerful. And I have two thoughts on the question. You know, one is, We've been through, I've been through three strategic plans now with the organization. I've had a career in the not-for-profit sector for a long time. I know, I've, I've seen what it worked, what it looks like for, to work with the HIV movement that was reliant on government funding. Uh, and a lot of those lessons around how I would build the organization really was around how do we shift the paradigm about that, that faces headwinds in our sector, right? Especially post COVID that there's a workforce that of really competitive people that d- deserve to be compensated well, particularly in like, we, I, our office is based in the city of Toronto. So what does it mean to be competitive? And it allowed me to really, uh, and, and with the support of my board, understand that we have to th- rethink our model. And so we, we're a charitable sector that has an infrastructure like a for-profit business, meaning that we set a baseline. Uh, this notion that, you know, we do this altruistic, important work and supposed to sacrifice everything else is, I mean, I'm sure you, we've talked about this in the sector. It's, it's passe, it's boring, you know, let's get over it. And we decided to just actually, in our last strategic plan, talk about what, we're, what it means to be a force to, for good. Uh, no person at Rainbow Railroad makes under $60,000. That is our flat baseline policy, including people with lived experience. And uh, the second part of this is what it means to center our work of people lived experience around how for an organization that works with newcomers, how do we center that work? Rainbow Railroad major advocacy goal. I mean, we're service delivery providers, but we've had to advocate for governments to partner with us in order to do pathways. The Senator mentioned Afghanistan, you know, that was a really frustrating intervention where we had to really cajole the government to now allow us to resettle uh, up towards a thousand people out of Afghanistan. In just June, if you Google Rainbow Railroad and me, you'll see an embarrassing picture with me and the prime minister uh, where they Canada announced a referring partnership with us and Rainbow Railroad. That means Rainbow Railroad and the UN Refugee Agency are the only two organizations that have a partnership with the government. Why am I mentioning that? Because our experiment was always about we need to get people out of safety. So we're like an ambulance. Let's get people out. And I thought that our work, that meant our work was focused not so much on resettlement and how to integrate newcomers when they arrive in multiple countries. But it occurs to me now that we've helped 2,000 people that we really need to understand if this experiment, this experiment only works if people are actually resettling and thriving in their communities, not living in the margins or facing the trauma of their persecution. 
And so we started to really think about what it meant to integrate the experiences of the people that we've helped in our work. And we've learned a couple of things that I think you should know. One is if we're really going to integrate newcomers in our sector, we have to do more than just talk the talk. And I'll give you a story. Someone that we helped resettle from a country into Canada joined our team. And when they first joined the staff person, because the person received benefits from Rainbow Railroad, they promoted themselves as having benefit from Rainbow Railroad. When they entered the office, everyone's first experience that first day was about, oh, how are you? Oh, welcome to Canada. Oh, things must be better. And your trauma. And she's like, Yo, I'm a master's degree. I've worked in, I've, I've got 10 times more experience than you. I'm not here for your pity. I'm here to con- contribute. I probably should be making more than you. And don't give me your Canadian patronizing effect of my own experience. And I think we do that all the time. And so really, there was really an important and illuminating moment for me around centering our work on newcomers who are supposed to shift our culture or who benefit from our culture really means actually being willing to step down your power and understand what it means to lead policy from the people that we're supposed to benefit and the newcomers that are supposed to come to Canada. So, Senator, you uh, we're recording this at the end of September, and you have an upcoming piece of legislation that sets out an increased threshold of diversity data being collected about our sector. Why is this important? at a time when our sector holds such diversity? Well, Bruce, I look around this room. I frankly don't see that much diversity. And diversity is not just what you see, but who you are. I accept that. So I think the sector has work to do. Uh, You may be employing people at entry-level positions, but I wonder how many of them are actually transitioning to senior leadership positions. I came to Canada in 1982, and I know when I went down to Bay Street, the only other person who looked like me on Bay Street were the people who served coffee. How different things are today when you go down to Bay Street. And I ascribe that largely to the force of employment equity. Employment equity forced federally regulated organizations to count and report. And by the virtue of counting and reporting, they raise their awareness. And 25, 30 years later, you see the result of an extremely diverse workforce in Toronto's financial services sector, way up to the top. So taking the lesson from employment equity, I want to translate into governance equity. And I'm starting with the charitable and not-for-profit sector because there is already legislation approved proposed by our government and approved in parliament that requires federally regulated businesses to report out annually on the demographics of their governance. In addition, it requires every federally regulated organization to table a diversity plan. It doesn't require them to do anything with the diversity plan, which I believe is a failing, but it still requires them to table a diversity plan. And my reasoning is that if you develop a plan, it sparks something. So my legislation is focused on the next sector. After business comes charities and not-for-profits. You all say we are an important, we're an essential part of the economy. We employ X million people. We contribute 8% to the GDP then I think that if, if, if that is true, then you also have to rise up to the bar by engaging in data collection. I met with uh, representatives who came to see me yesterday, wonderful people, and they talked about the importance of data. This bill will require charities and not-for-profits who are registered federally. All charities are federal, but not all not-for-profits are federal and will focus on charities and require them annually to disclose the demographics of their governance. Now, this data, it will never be able to disclose the governance makeup of a particular organization. So this is not about naming and shaming. This is about roll-up data that could be disaggregated by region. So we could see 
Manitoba does way better than Alberta. I'm making this up, but you know what I mean to say. You could see whether or not the newcomer services sector is better on governance equity than the child support sector. You could sort of make those comparisons and that kind of sector disaggregation would enable the sector to look at a mirror and say, does this reflect the reality of who I am serving? Obviously, there are some organizations that will, because of the nature of their mission or their location, they may not be able to reach the bar of being representative of the demographics of a na- at a national level. But knowing the spread of not-for-profits and charities in this country, I believe this will be your first step to getting the data that you need. So I hope you will support it. Final question to both of you as we, as we wrap this up. What gives you hope for the future? Two things. One is our organization has demonstrated that uh, collectively we can solve big problems. And I still really believe that. And our, our deal with the government took a lot of advocacy, collective door knocking. Uh, it took the army of our communities. Uh, and so when the world feels like a huge dumpster fire, uh, what gives our team hope is that we can do it collectively together. And I, I, I ha- I'd have to close by also, you know, shouting out that uh, I'm also proud to serve on the board uh, for the Foundation for Black Communities, uh, founder Lee Ben, uh, all the in the back. Uh, and the Foundation for Black Communities, if you don't know this foundation, you should know, talk to Lee Ben or myself. This April got rewarded a $200 million endowment to serve black communities. And you should clap for that. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, when we think, no, we can't, no, we can't change the the lines we put for salaries or things are too stuck or governments are not going to change. Uh, what, re, why I sat on the board was so remarkable, that experience, is that Lee Bad and the four f- co-founders just started three and a half years ago, Lee Bad, was it? Right? And just imagine, in the middle of a pandemic, what was it like to like push the government to recenter this idea that Black communities need a fund founded by Black communities? And they pushed, and they created a white paper, and this endowment happened three years later. So I know we seem skeptical, but I'm going to really encourage you that if you seem skeptical, you're part of the problem, that we can collectively solve these problems. And I really, what gives me hope in the face of the foundation was, you know, and, and tying it back to refugees, our office, a Rainbow Rail's office is at 401 Richmond. If you know 401 Richmond in Toronto, it's at Spadina and Peter. And right outside our office, in, in, the, in the conversation we're having about what it means to provide sources for resettlement, right across the street from our office is the Fred Victor Center. And I bike every day to work. Um, I used to actually live in Kansas Market. I know St. Stephen as well. Uh, I now I live at Queen and Broadview. I've become an East End gay, but that's a whole other story. Um, and so I bike and over the past month or so saw firsthand the encampment. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry, you should, of the refugee housing crisis, like dozens of black and brown folks on the street. And so we're talking about like equitable jobs. I mean, we'll start with equitable housing. And the foundation was what, what gives me hope is the way that our sector stepped up, including leadership from the Foundation for Black Communities and others, to provide responses to that housing crisis immediately. Government didn't do it. The city didn't do it. The province did it. Our sector did it. And so what gives me hope is that collectively, we can strategize and solve big problems. Well, I think you give me hope. Uh, And I could give you an aspirational, inspirational story, but I won't. I will say that the work that you do throughout this country and overseas is the glue that holds us together. I don't think we understood it quite as much until the COVID crisis arose. And then it was all about paying attention to the sector. Now, the crisis has come and gone, but there is a reality that abides. Every parliamentarian is associated sometime in their life with a charity or a not-for-profit profit. So what gives me hope is that you need to capitalize that. I can tell you that in my work on charities, I had the support of 
every party in the Senate and every party in the House of Commons. It is very unusual, colleagues, in this in these very politically fractured times to find single issues that everyone can agree on. And I believe charities and not-for-profits are one of those single issues. And I hope, I hope that you will have more of these gatherings with more announcement announcements. I can also tell you that the most powerful ministry in the government, which is the Ministry of Finance, has its eyes and ears open for the sector. And the proof lies in the pudding. I know that there are issues with the alternative minimum tax, and I am happy to work alongside with you, Bruce, on a, on a tactical, strategic way. But there are big picture issues and tiny issues. And I, I believe both in the transformational and the incremental. And with that, I will leave the story of hope. Inspiring words from both of you as we close off. Please join me in welcoming uh, both of our guests for joining us today on the podcast. Thanks for listening to the Let's Imagine podcast. For full show notes and to subscribe to our newsletter so you never miss an episode, please visit our website, www.imaginecanada.ca. Also, if you really like this episode, we invite you to leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to this podcast, as this helps other people discover us and engage in these conversations. And again, thanks to our sponsors, Carter's Professional Corporation, for supporting our podcast.